MG. For the longest time, if you wanted a sports car and you didn't have a lot of money, you bought something with those letters on it. About the idea of doing more with less, about romance, about maybe occasionally putting up with quirks and quibbles and wanting to go over to England to pour warm beer on the head of some sheep farmer because you were so frustrated. But the good parts were really, really good. And it doesn't get much better in the world of MGs than an MGA. The big draw here is the romance. It used to be that the people who bought MGs bought them for one of two reasons. They wanted to go racing, and they didn't have a lot of money, or they wanted a top-down sports car that felt great. It didn't necessarily make a lot of speed, but it handled well and it stopped well, and it was built out of relatively durable stuff. The bits underneath are fairly simple. There's a ladder frame, there's a pushrod four-cylinder, a four-speed manual, independent front suspension, this is a late MGA, so it has discs on it. And there's a live axle in the back. These cars still have lever arm shocks. They're relatively heavy for what they are. But it all adds up to something more. And the shape, those fenders, it's heartbreakingly elegant. There's charm here, charm in spades, just fire hosing out of the thing, far beyond what the blueprint says. MG stands for Morris Garages. The company started its life as a dealer for Morris Cars in Oxford, England. And a man named Cecil Kimber, who worked for Morris, started rebodying and hot-rodding Morris Cars, selling them to customers who wanted a little bit more. It went over so well that Morris eventually gave him his own factory, his own line. They went racing. Cars, for half a century, represented the idea of doing more with less and making something special out of a pile of components that didn't necessarily start life as special. The styling was based on a late T-Series, a TD model, that had been taken to Le Mans and rebodied for top speed. The factory loved it so much that even though that man who took the car to Le Mans was a privateer, they used the lines and converted them into a road car. It somehow manages to embody everything that the company did before the war and everything that would come after, but also feel like something entirely new and different. <laughs> Steering is light. The gearbox is one of the best gearboxes in the history of gearboxes. Probably only equaled by the gearbox in an early Miata. It's direct. That whole rifle bolt cliche. It's accurate. It's just satisfying to use. It's a car of balance. There's no excess here. Not in power, not in brakes, not in grip. But you don't mind because the balance is why you're here. Most MGAs look the same. That said, they're generally broken up by their drive lines. The drive lines changed with model. There's the 1500, the 1600, and the twin cam. Within the 1600, there's the 1600 Mark I, the 1600 Mark II, and a deluxe version of each of those cars. The twin cam was a competition-oriented car that was a long eyeball copy of an Alpha 1900 motor. Sounds great, makes more power, Got a bad rap and period for being a little cantankerous, but ultimately is still the one you want for collectability, for a little more performance. They make a nice amount of power and they sound great. The early cars tend to be a little fiddlier in detail. There are some interior differences, some trim differences. The later cars in particular, the Mark II, has this recessed grille, has taillights turned on its side and the back. None of these things are bad or good, it just comes down to taste. Later MGAs tend to be a little bit more usable, a little more practical, have a little more torque, they break a little better. Early MGAs feel a little more 1950s vibrant, if you will. None of them are bad cars. All of them are great to use, practical, and relatively reliable, but it comes down to which car you're buying, as with anything else. So you want to be careful and you want to make sure that you're buying the one that is best for you, but also that you're buying a solid car. So these are neat cars. One of the things that make them special is that the lids, the doors, this tongue-shaped hood, that trunk, are aluminum, while the body is steel. The motor is what's known as the B-Series. This is a three-main bearing version of the engine that would later appear in the MGB, which everyone knows, the quintessential sports car, quintessential British sports car, with five main bearings. There's not a lot going on here. It's a long-stroke pushrod engine, has a lot in common 
believe it or not, with an early Chevy 235 six-cylinder. It was originally designed for low RPM and torque, which means that in sports car use, it tends to require a little more attention and care for high RPM, high speed use. Access isn't great under the hood, but there's not much here that's gonna be difficult to work on. Everything under here is pretty simple. The carbs, for example. It's got two side draft SUs. Each one has very few moving parts. There's not a lot to go wrong. Rough idle is typically caused by wear around the throttle shafts. There's a float bolt, there's a piston, there's a butterfly valve. There's not much else there. If the car runs poorly and the owner thinks it's carbs, ask why it hasn't been addressed. These are easy to work on and relatively simple to get right, and there are a lot of specialists. SUs have appeared on many, many cars over the years. If somebody doesn't know what they're doing, they're easy to make run poorly. But if you know what they're doing, it's pretty easy to get the car to behave and behave all the time. So again, the B-Series was later used in the MGB, but it was also used in a lot of BMC and British Leyland cars. What that means is that there's an intense amount of knowledge on making these things run well, making them be leak-free, making them make power, making them great fuel economy, anything you want a B-Series to do, chances are somebody's already done it. This is essentially the motor that's in the MGB, minus a few of the advances. It makes a little less power and a little less torque than it does in a B, and it's smaller, but other than that, anybody who can work on an MGB can work on this, and any British car shop in the country can work on an MGB. Power is from 68 to just over 100 horsepower, depending on model. This is a late 1600 Mark II, the strongest pushrod version, so it would have originally made just over 90. This in particular is an original unrestored car. It's got just 28,000 miles on it. It's almost a bellwether. There isn't a bad line on it. There's one key thing that separates the MGB from the MGA. The MGB is unibody. The MGA is body on frame. When you look for an MGA, the body condition should be your number one concern. This is a car made of sweeping arcs and compound curves, which means it's very easy to assemble one in a way that it kind of looks like a bitza, where all the panels are just kind of hanging on it. If it's done right, this big sweeping curve, that fender, the nose, the tail, it should look like one big form. If the car's had a lot of body work, a lot of rust repair, it can be very difficult to get everything to line up right. In particular, one of the main things you want to look for when you're looking at an MGA is this section. This is known as the F section. The pillars that hang the doors and where the rockers tie into the front and rear fenders, this whole section will tell you more about the condition of the body than anything else. Open the door, lift it on its hinges, move it back and forth, rock it. The areas in the sill, this structure where the, the crease comes down out of the fender, all of this is intensely difficult to get aligned right if the car has been apart, and when you lift the body off of the frame, there's not much connecting the front and the rear. It's very easy to get the alignment off when you're assembling it again. Most reproduction parts fit well at this point, but there are still a lot of body panels that come out and don't have the right curves or don't simply look proper compared to the rest of the car if it came out of the factory. Be careful. So much of getting an MGA right is this area. If it's done right, it won't look like three separate panels. It will look like one sweeping curve with some lines in it. These gaps need to be even. It's extremely difficult to get these doors to fit right. I know, I've restored an MGA. This area can suck up an enormous amount of time. Finally, one of the other things to look at is the condition of the piping. This plastic piping runs between the fenders and the main body on all four corners of the car. If it's wrinkled, if it's pulling, if it's bound up, you'll know that the people who assembled it didn't spend a lot of time to get it right. If it's done right, it should be just tucked in and virtually watertight. If it's been done wrong, the car will look like a mess. Again, it's pretty easy to tell. If you've seen one clean MGA, you'll know. Like most MGs, these are fairly simple cars, but there are a lot of places to check for rust. The frame itself is relatively stout steel. It's thick gauge stuff. Structural integrity is rarely a problem, but the integrity of the body is important, and the integrity of some of the detail bits on the frame are important. Basic construction is relatively simple. There's a live axle, there's four lever shocks, independent front suspension, not a lot else. The two chassis rails come forward and tie into a relatively stout firewall structure, which means the car doesn't have a lot of cowl shake. It feels more stiff than it is and more stout than you would expect. But you do want to be careful. Get under any car you're looking at and check the rails, check the sills, check the floors. Let me show you. So the first place you want to check is the floors. Floors on an MGA 
are plywood and they fit into small angle pieces on each side because the floors are wood they hold water they collect water when they get really really wet the edges of the frame that hold the floors in are known for rusting out the floor falls out of the car you want to look at the battery brackets in the back these cars originally had two six volt batteries one hung on each side of the drive shaft accessible through a panel in the back of the cockpit most cars have been converted to one 12 volt battery but because water gets tossed up battery acid, a thousand other reasons, these battery brackets rust away, fall out, the batteries fall out of the car. The edges of the frame are critical. There's a very small gap where the frame meets the edge of the body and where the sill panels come down to meet in between it. It often gets packed with mud, dirt, water, a thousand other things, rots apart. The frame itself is stout and structurally is usually fine. It's the details and everything that's attached to it and the body you want to be careful about. The rear fenders, these big sweeping fenders, these areas. Anywhere there's a curve in the car that sweeps underneath itself, mud and water get trapped. Any of the seams, these cars were really not rust proof from the factory in any way, shape or form. As with any British car of this vintage, you want to be paranoid about rust. And if the car has been restored, which it probably has, you want to be paranoid about the quality of work that has been done. There are a lot of these things on the market. You have a lot to choose from. Don't buy in haste. Be choosy and look at whatever you're looking at deeply. Pay for a pre-purchase inspection on these things. It matters. Don't rush into a purchase. You can get real in over your head real quick. An MG MGA 1600 Mark II, a number two excellent condition, went for about $33,000 in 2006 and remained stable, dipping to 275 in 2009. Values began climbing again in mid-2013 to around $32,000, but as of September 2020, they've settled slightly lower at around $30,000. This video review is intended to give an overview of what it's like to buy and drive an MGA, but keep in mind that values change over time. For even more details and up-to-date information, please check the link below for our full buyer's guide on Haggerty.com. So many British cars get a bad rap for what they don't do well. But as we get further and further from the era of great British sports cars, as that stuff recedes more and more into the past, what lingers is just the idea, and the feeling, what they did do well. How a car like this with the top down on a road like this, on a day like this, could make you feel great. No caveats, no exceptions, just great. unless you're behind a Toyota Yaris who decides to do 18 miles an hour. I have feelings, old chap, and you're in my way.